I'm getting excited, bro. See, they, they overstimulated me. But I don't want to stab anyone because no one's done anything wrong. That is a gun you're off. Well. Yum, cuz. Well. Well. Anthony Lees was the sort of bloke you'd cross the street to avoid. Well. Hey, Hurus. Well. By 30, he'd spent most of his life behind bars. Spanion. With over 1.6 million followers across his three biggest social media platforms, the once troubled kid from Ulamalu has transcended into the Australian mainstream and is now one of the biggest figures in Australian culture. So how did we get here? Like many rises to the top, it wasn't straightforward. The story of Spanion was a tumultuous whirlwind of crime, violence and addiction that would have folded many. After over a decade-long saga that teetered on the brink of self-destruction, let's take a look at not only how we got here, but why Spanion has transformed into an Australian icon. We start in the inner west of Sydney in Marrickville, where Anthony Lees, aka Spanion, was raised by his mother and uncle here until the age of 10. From a young age, Spanion felt different. He was surrounded by family who were renowned criminals in the area. His home life largely differed from his classmates exposed to consistent substance abuse, primarily from his uncle, whose drug of choice was The drug of choice for many in the mid-1990s in Sydney. At 11, Spanion would move from Marrickville to Woolloomooloo after his mother had been accepted for public housing. Spanion was by no means an angel, already being expelled from multiple schools for violence and general delinquency. Although already recognised as a kid that was troubled, it was in Woolloomooloo where Spanion's criminal tendencies flourished. The inner west of Sydney has experienced major gentrification over the past two decades, with the median house price over a million dollars currently. But during the 90s and early 2000s, Sydney's social housing enclaves were a free-for-all, where robberies, violence and drug abuse were the norm. Spanion no longer felt like the outsider, and after another school expulsion, this time at Glebe High School, Spanion would transition into a true life of crime. After his mother pled with the New South Wales Education Department, Spanion was accepted into Dover Heights to continue Grade 8. The school reluctantly accepted him and within a month Spanion would commit his most nefarious act yet. At 14, Spanion had already become accustomed to petty crime, often stealing mobile phones from students' bags. In 2001, the Nokia 8850 was a hot commodity which resold for $400, a way for Spanion to make money. At one lunch break, he attempted to steal another phone but was spotted and was outed to the principal. Spanion denied accountability and this would eventuate into a scuffle between Spanion and the principals resulting in a suspension. I'm sure this alone would eclipse many of our wrongdoings in school. Like who fights the principal of a school they've just been accepted to? Well, it gets incredibly unhinged. The next day, Spanion was adamant on finding who snitched and in what can only be described as psychopathic, returned to his high school with a knife. I'll let Spanion himself elaborate on the school siege. And I just confronted the class, just one class. I confronted the class and I said, listen, you who the fuck said that I stole the phone? Which dog wants to get fucking stabbed? Blah, 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 whatever I said. I don't remember exact details of what I said. I'm getting excited, bro. See, they, they overstimulated me. But I don't want to stab anyone because no one's done anything wrong. They come out and the principal seen me in front of the whole school and he yells at me at the <laughs> megaphone. He says, Anthony, just go away. Put the knife down and leave the school. And they knew, bro, like they knew that I was a twisted kid, bro. Because oh, I didn't know how scared they were. I'm thinking, why are you so scared, bro? I'm just a 14-year-old kid with a knife. Like, is it going on like it's fucking wow. Bin Laden, you know? And so two men come with shovels. Two men come up with shovels and two men with no shovels. And I've seen them, bro, and I think, I'm going to fight grown men with shovels like they're grown men you know i'm a little kid the siege would make national news at the time and resulted in a major lawsuit that altered rules around expulsion and student transfers he would receive a litany of charges but due to his age he would spend just one month in cobham youth justice center where he received therapy and psychological evaluation the siege incident essentially kick-started spanion's criminal career where from the ages of 14 to 18 he just spent eight months outside of juvenile prison what started as simple carjackings evolved into ram raids and breaking and entering crimes as these crimes funded his addiction. Although not uncommon for underage in Australia to sink a couple tins or smoke some darts, Sydney's inner west became a haven for use. And it was no different for Spanion, who went from smoking the substance at 14 to injecting at 16. This quote sums up the attitude towards when at the time in the area. It's like if you weren't on you weren't one of the boys. As funny as that sounds, but that's that's the truth. All the other, all the older boys that we looked up to, the bank robbers, the ram raiders, the searchers, they were fanatics. Our peers, 
fanatics. In hindsight, that sounds ridiculous, and I know that's not the case for a lot of the world, but here it was. With a lack of role models to tell him otherwise, its usage was embraced by Spanion, and it was almost a rite of passage. This usage dictated much of Spanion's early life, admitting, My crimes weren't glorious crimes. These are full-blown addiction crimes. Didn't have much foresight or even care to have the foresight of how my life would change when I first used it. Just loved the fact that I was using it. I felt more accepted by the people around me. And that's what we do. That's it. He would progress to shooting up over $1,000 a day, which led him to overdose and be brought back to life on multiple occasions. Escaping a hospital whilst being prepared for surgery and evading the police in an insane car chase are just some of the stories that arose from his juvenile delinquency, as he was transported from juvenile to adult prison when he turned 18. Spanion's sentences would only increase and the seriousness of his crimes would also. Amidst the chaos of juvenile and adult prison, he found solitude in the routine that prison presented as he did not know any different. In his cell in 2007, with just under a year left in his sentence, he had, as Spanion describes, either psychosis or divine intervention, when he spotted himself in the mirror's reflection. I walked in it in that one split second. This is why I say, I don't know if it was a psychosis or divine intervention. I seen the true me. I looked in that mirror and I seen a full, ugly, putrid, junkie, loser, like that. He had been disgusted with addiction and in the moment decided he would become clean. Unlike most addicts that Spanion grew up with, who were unable to free themselves from addiction and lost their lives, he would take himself off buprenorphine and would suffer extreme withdrawal symptoms for three weeks in prison. He said he reveled in the withdrawal symptoms as he felt it was his body ridding himself of the addiction. With this mindset shift, he would eliminate all substances and train relentlessly for the remaining year of his sentence. He did this without any sort of rehabilitation or reintegration programs which he'd been excluded from as he was labelled as an escape risk because of a runner he did from the police at 16. You'd assume this lifestyle change stemmed from his want to escape his life of crime, but in fact his motives revolved around being a sharper criminal. Unfortunately, Spanion, even without the substances, was filled with aggression, and let's be real, a psycho. Within a day of his release, he'd already committed probably his most heinous crime yet, being a mutual friend with a box cutter after the victim had an argument with Spanion's friend eight months earlier. After six days on the run, Spanion was yet again incarcerated and was incredibly fortunate to get his sentence lowered from 12 years to three and a half. Spanion remained clean during this prison stint with his intentions shifting from violence to making money through dealing. He had dreams of a lavish lifestyle and transforming from a junkie criminal to the mastermind of the Sydney streets. Upon his release, things started slowly with his drug operation finding little traction in its first three months. Through networking and a change of methods, the Spanion enterprise boomed in the Sydney area as he went from making $250 a day to around $28,000 daily, which Spanion pocketed a third of after the money was distributed to his runners and back into the operation. At its peak in 2011, the empire had expanded throughout Sydney's inner suburbs, with Spanion not even having to lift a finger. Just six months after his release, Spanion was living that lavish lifestyle he desired, spending the earnings on tattoos, cars, and jewelry. He had more money than he knew what to do with and got to fulfill his fixation of being the so-called top dog. Spanion's time outside of prison would last a total of 11 months before the police would arrest him once again. This was no surprise though to Spanion saying, I'm not even trying to stay out of jail. I'm not even trying to stay out of jail. I belong in jail. Me and the brothers from around here, brothers from Redfern, Waterloo, Glebe, that participate in, in this life, we institutionalised. We refer to you as civilians. We refer to this as the outside world. This is a holiday for us, so. Prison had become his home and he was sentenced to eight years in prison and would serve five of those years before being released in 2017. It was during this period where he finally shifted away from his want to be a criminal. He felt he had achieved all he'd wanted in the crime world and was ready to move on with his life. The question upon his release was, well, what do I do now? Spanion contributes the death of his older brother and the birth of his first son, which both occurred during his final stint in prison as significant reasons as to why he removed himself from the prison cycle. Like, and I walked up into his bedroom and it's his bedroom, bro, and it's my five-year-old son showing me his bedroom for the first time. He said, dad, I love you. Can you keep me forever? And like he was a pet. And I said, of course I can keep you forever, my boy. At 31 years of age, Spanion had spent 13 years of his life in prison, with 11 months his longest period outside of a cell. He had now been clean for six years and had a lot of lost time to make up for. 
The issue for Spanion was how can someone so institutionalized transition back into society? For Spanion, his way back into the world was through music, more specifically rap. With a speak that ill child, you ain't saying that that ill child. A skill he had honed throughout his prison life, often writing verses in his cell. Australian hip hop fans quickly became enthralled by his ability to tell stories through his music. Singles released like Head Monsters, Ilche, and Detestables would popularize Spanion in the Australian hip hop underground and have now amassed over 4 million views on YouTube. He would keep plugging away with his music, and although he had seen success, it was his social media videos that were gaining him a cult following. The phrases like Let's Oge Lad and Hudus caught fire by his socials and gained him national recognition. Spanion's music defining quality was its storytelling and although the songs weren't everyone's cup of tea, he knew that both his music and short videos had people engaged and in late 2019 Spanion transitioned into YouTube starting his Hood Talk and Logic series. These videos consisted of Spanion and Ali or Car having a yarn to the camera. The topics often revolved around wild stories from his past criminal career or more personal talks about dealing with anxiety or drug and alcohol treatment. This content was not flashy, but it quickly found its audience, whether it was the law-abiding citizens who enjoyed the outrageous crime stories, or viewers that related with the struggle and resonated with Span's words of wisdom. These videos would frequently rack up hundreds of thousands of views, and saw Spanion's YouTube channel grow to 68,000 subscribers, and his Instagram to over 150,000 followers by September 2021. He continued to capitalize on his viewers' appetite for storytelling, starting the Search podcast where he hosted some of the biggest names of the Australian criminal underworld. During this period, Spanion would release the video Eating the Five Weirdest Foods from an Asian Supermarket, which did extremely well, something that Spanion would capitalize on. He followed this up with the It's All Eat series where Spanion showcased food from across Australia, which became an instant classic. Spanion's phrase of Wow, what a coffee! Well, well, cuz, well, well, redeem, redeem. Caught on with the public, with many making their own food reviews impersonating him. Slamming a feed whilst watching the series became commonplace for many Aussies, helping Spanion solidify his fan base on the platform. The series would go global as Spanion ate his way through Europe, Asia, and the Middle East, with these videos averaging 400,000 views per video. This series combined with a mixture of car related content and some big collaborations with Alex Pereira, Friendly Geordies, and a feature on A Current Affair helped Spanion get to 250,000 subscribers by September of 2022. He was now a household name amongst content creators in Australia, but his next endeavour would catapult Spanion's name globally. His Into the Hood series, where he travels through some of the world's most dangerous neighbourhoods, would see instant success. The series encapsulates the reality for many of these disadvantaged citizens, and how Spanion can resonate with these people is where the episodes really shine. The series has given places like Mount Druitt, Alice Springs and Darwin, which are often overlooked by the country's mainstream outlets, a platform to highlight their experiences. Eight of these videos have reached over 1.5 million views individually in the past six months, which has blown up Spanion's channel. His subscriber count would explode from 250,000 in September 2022 to 636,000 currently, with 100,000 of those subscribers subscribing just the past month. He would also start a second vlog channel, which has just under 100,000 subscribers in three months. His TikTok and Instagram now sit under 600,000 followers, and it's safe to say Spanion has transformed from one of Sydney's most brazen criminals to now a social media star. These numbers and statistics may explain the redemption arc of Spanion in terms of fame, but it doesn't answer as to why Australians love Spanion. On the surface, Spanion seems easy to dislike, a career crook whose outspoken nature could rub many the wrong way. You could write off this story as just another internet celebrity who is having his moment of fame and will quickly fade away. But if you can get past the accent and the colorful language, there is substance to the content. Although not using the Queen's English per se, Spanion has an excellent ability to articulate his words in an authentic way. There is a rawness within his personality which is hard to emulate and is a key reason as to why he has been so successful. Possibly from a combination of his early childhood and life in prison, he had never had to conform to societal norms and is unapologetically him. Whether it's him freaking out in the Haunted House video, there was a or his genuine reaction to the sufferings of Cambodian genocide. Only eight adults and four children have ever survived, and that's them. A fool can't do this, eh? You get to see more than just this hardened criminal persona. This authenticity and understanding of being an outsider allows content like the Into the Hood series to thrive, or is why 300,000 viewers are happy to sit through a 40 minute plus unedited vlog. 
You can see in his recent vlog in Thailand how he's become a man of the people and his genuine reactions he's having with fans. Hey, what are you doing? Uh, I'm from Bangladesh originally, but I live in Australia. Oh, mad. For studying, yeah, so that's why I've seen your videos on yeah, yeah. stuff. Hey, hey don't mind. What are you doing at life? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, bro. Yeah, yeah, what are you talking about, cuz? We're yeah, talking about La Le It's no secret that everyone loves a good underdog story, and Spanion represents that. Early followers like me have seen the growth from his early content to today. He seems considerably more on edge in his earlier videos, as he gets accustomed to the outside world. You can't say that I'm filming here. You walk right past the camera. Are you normal, bro? Big siege up there. Come on, bro. I'm fucking recording something. Leave me alone, bro. Wait, bro. Come on, get out the way. Oh, I'm good. You're right, bro. Remember back in the days when I used to do the hood talks? Now it's not his fault. I'm on the sidewalk. But before, bro, I used to do hood talks right over by myself and they walk in front of the camera. And I used to battle pedestrian. From watching someone go from a cell to witnessing his raw reactions to exploring the world for the first time is interesting in itself. He doesn't excuse himself for his past, but admits the effects being institutionalized has on a person. Simple things like understanding social media and building interpersonal relationships are things that he missed in prison and is now just learning. At 31, Spanion could have re-offended and accepted that crime was his life, but he managed to make something out of himself. His content inspires many, which can be seen in his comment sections, which is always inundated with positive messages. Is this video trying to glorify his past wrongdoings or portray him as a saint? No, not at all. The bloke was a genuine criminal for a long time and he himself is aware of that. Whether you love or hate Spanion, to go from being a serial crook, overdosed on Sydney streets, to escaping that lifestyle by producing content that inspires and entertains many across the world, is a story that at least had to be told. If all fails, I'm very blessed bro. Very blessed. My life, I don't know what, I don't know what's happening with my life, but I just thank God. Like, that's all I do. I don't dwell on it. But I don't know why it's so good, why I deserve this. I'm not sure. But if it ever doesn't pan out, if it ever doesn't continue this way, it doesn't matter to me. I'm happy because, like, I'm happy living off bare minimum. No one knows who I am. Yeah, I've done 13 years in prison. It's no different to me because, but I'm thankful for what I have. Hello everyone, Alpha is back after a year hiatus. If you enjoyed the video, press the like button. If you want to see more of this type of content, subscribe and comment down below what you guys think of Spanion. As for the channel, expect it to stay sports oriented, but I will be making content about other stuff I'm interested in. Um, I'm glad to be back.